All right, good evening. Thank you everyone for coming. Today we have a special speaker, Mark Heckler from VMware, yep. former Pivotal. Yep. Uh, so, just a quick question. How many of you are first timers? All right, quite a few. Nice. Great, great. Thank you for coming, thank you for joining. We do have those monthly sessions, free, always free. We also have the hands-on workshop with Chandra, which should be here <laughs> soon, uh, handled. It's also free. Uh, so thanks for joining. If you are not following us on social media, please do. Twitter is where we are more active. Um, Frank is on the location. Yeah, Frank, which is the, the <laughs> head of the group, he's on vacations, he's enjoying some sunny time, I expect. So Rodrigo is the Frank. Yeah, I'm Frank, looks like. Um, where else? Well, there's Chandra, our senior member there. Hello, Chandra. Uh, right. Before we start, is there any questions? Anything someone wants to ask? Anything Java related? Chandra can answer. I have a question. How many of you followed me on JavaScript on Twitter? I want to see more hands next time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do, and we also have a few first timers as well, which is very good. Okay, so without further ado, let me give you Mark Eckler. Thank you, Mark, for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay. Okay. Well, hey, thanks for inviting me. Thank, thank you, Rodrigo and Chandra Bing. <laughs> I just feel like in New York, it ought to be Chandra Bing. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we have a young group here who doesn't have friends. That's disturbing. Okay. All right. Anyway, so um, let's get started. I hear I only have four hours tonight, so we'll try to make this quick. Yep. And no groans, no crying, no running for the door. Wow, this is a quiet group. <laughs> have I somehow slipped into Knitters Anonymous or something? Like knitting? Huh? Oh, nice. Hi, Raleigh. Hey. <laughs> Yay, all right. So they can hear me, or at least they can see my hands. So that's a good sign. Can you hear me? Yes? No? Okay, good. So, so we have one person who can hear me. That's great. All right, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so hey, welcome, and thanks for coming. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about what I like to refer to as game of streams, or how to tame and get the most from your messaging platforms. Uh, my name is Paul Heckler. I'll give you more about me in a little bit, but not too much because that's too much. Um, I Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the, the thing at the bottom right corner is kind of new to me too. Uh, Pivotal, and before that, Spring Source by VMware, I sound familiar, uh, was, have been traditionally the shepherds, and before that, Spring Source, and before that, who knows, Interface 21. Uh, but they have been the shepherds of, of the Spring Framework and the various Spring projects for a very, very long time. Uh, but um, Pivotal actually was bought by a, our, one of our sister companies, VMware, uh, at the end of last year. Officially, the whole thing transaction completed January 2nd. So it's still a little weird for me to say that, but we're all part of VMware family now. Um, and that's pretty cool, actually, because we've got the same team, by and large, uh, and we're doing the same thing, by and large. <laughs> we just have a different company name with it up top of our checks, so that's, that's all good. Uh, but VMware gives us a little more depth and breadth, right? Uh, but tonight we're not going to talk about any of that. We're here to focus on Spring and Kafka and RabbitMQ and some of the cool stuff you can do with it to make your life easier and your systems, your distributed systems, more performant and scalable. So with that, um, who here has had the strange situation where you get to the end of the year and your boss comes up to them and says, great job. I was hoping that next year I could double your budget and you could slow things down a little bit because you're producing way too much stuff. Yeah, that happens to all of us, right? It's such a quandary. Kidding. Okay, yeah, if you really are in that position, please do let me know. I'd like to write up a proposal for a government grant. Five, 10 million ought to do it. We can study you and your organization. Life will be grand. I'll even split proceeds with you, maybe? I don't know, we'll figure that out. But anyway, that never happens, right? We're always asked to, at the very best, in the very best of situations, we're always asked to do more with the same amount of resources. Typically, we're asked to do more with less. Uh, and that's why we're constantly looking for better solutions, which are more scalable, which are more performant, which allow us to do the same or more load with fewer resources. 
And that's what we're here kind of to talk about tonight in a, in a nutshell. So who am I? Uh, I have authored several blogs and blog posts. I've co-authored a couple of books. I have another book in the pipeline, actually. Uh, I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, but suffice it to say for now, I'm an architect and developer by trade. And as you might surmise from the next point where most of my expertise has been won, it's been in the Java ecosystem. Um, most of my expertise, uh, some groovy, a lot of Java for several years, uh, many, many years, <laughs> and uh, some Kotlin. Any Kotlin fans in here too? Yeah, groovy? Yeah, that's yeah, good. Uh, Java is doing amazing things now with a, a, a six month release cycle and more innovation, uh, but that doesn't mean that the other JVM languages are bad, right? Uh, in fact, Spring Framework uh, 5.0, when it was GA'd in 2017, uh, embrace Kotlin as a full first-class citizen. So if you're a Kotlin developer, who's also a Spring developer, and you've not overlapped those two domains a lot, get busy. Uh, it, it's out there, and, and Kotlin is an amazing language with a lot of innovation happening. Uh, it's kind of cool to see the dynamics. It's not an either-or, by the way. It's not like a, a hard cutover like we typically have seen. Sometimes Scala was a little hard to, to see how things interrelated or interoperated, I should say. Uh, Kotlin is a super interoperable language with, with Java. You can even integrate it in the same project, and it's painless, completely painless. Uh, so if you haven't tried it, kick the tires. I was a reluctant convert, but I like it. Um, still, Java's my first love, so uh, do what makes you happy. We support both. And Groovy's in there as well, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a big thing. Uh, I am a Java champion, Java 1 Rockstar, Groundbreaker Ambassador, a handful of other awards and honorifics that still mean I have to buy my own coffee. I don't know who I need to see about that. I really appreciate the honors, but still, I have to buy my own jet fuel, so go figure. Uh, I am a professional problem solver, as are you, or you wouldn't be here, right? That's what we live for, is figuring out problems, the solutions to them, and then creating better solutions over time. Uh, I am a Spring developer and advocate. I write code, I commit code, I talk about code. Uh, so it's kind of the best of all worlds in my opinion because I like to code and I like to talk, so it works. I am the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. Uh, así que si eres hispano hablante, déjame extender tu voz. If you are not a Spanish speaker, just ignore, that's fine. Uh, but uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I realized that Spanish being the second or fourth most spoken language on the planet, depending on who you listen to, what source, um, we weren't doing a great job of disseminating information. I felt like I could help with that. I speak Spanish poorly, even worse than English, but I try, right, and I have a good time. Uh, I also tend to pick up a lot of different Spanish from a lot of different countries, which means no matter where I go, people laugh at me. It's all right, they laugh at me anyway, even in English, so that's fine. But if you do produce materials in Spanish, or if you know of some and you want to share with the community, it's a win-win. Ping me, uh, DM me. Uh, um, I actually have springnoticias.io, uh, the website, and I also have Spring Noticias Twitter account. So just ping me, I happily help you reach the greater community. If, again, if you're not a Spanish speaker, ignore. All right, so I do have a new book that will be coming out August 1st. I'm working on that feverishly. Uh, I'm actually deflecting an awful lot of speaking engagements so I can stay home and write so I don't get crushed by my editor. Uh, but I had talked with Rodrigo about this a long time ago and I did not want to like reschedule change. So August 1st, right? Um, this is not the real cover. This is just a parody cover I created online. And I was looking, you know, O'Reilly always has an animal, right? And I was like, what animal could it be? Well, I figured spring up and running. It has to be running, right? I'm a running monkey. That's kind of how I view myself. I fit neatly in overhead bins and airplanes. So I thought, spring boot up and running, I'll, I'll, I'll get a monkey. That's the closest I could find. My only concern now is that O'Reilly's gonna stick me with this cover. We'll see. So far, they haven't decided. So, um, can't buy it yet. If you wanna know more about it, if you wanna follow the progress, laugh at me when I'm behind deadlines, um, follow me on Twitter. That's the best way to reach me, mkheck. Um, Anyway, so with that, actually, you know what? I do need to back up and well, I'll just keep it here. That's fine. So if you, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, if you're like me, you always think of the stuff you want to ask or, or mention 10 minutes after you walk out the door. It happens, right? That's when the best ideas come to you, that in the shower. But if you think of something later, uh, my email addresses, I'll, I'll share them again at the end. Uh, but, and that's fine. I do monitor email from time to time. Uh, but I am always on Twitter. Wherever I am, whatever time of day, whatever time of night, it's a sad life, but it's mine. Uh, but MK Heck, that's the best way to reach me. So if you don't follow me on Twitter, why first? Why? 
Um, follow NY Java SIG and NKX. Uh, but if you do follow me, great. Uh, keep keep tabs on the announcements. So today, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about a few things, and then we're going to launch into code. I had originally, and and I, this talk is is constantly evolving. Uh, I did a similar talk to this last year, widely regarded as solid, happy people were good with it, and I thought let's tear it up and do something different. So I. <laughs> I repackaged it, I changed it, I, I keep adding stuff to it. I've given this talk like twice before, well, three times standing this afternoon now. That's right. um, but every time it's a little different because I keep thinking of things I want to add, which means that depending on time constraints, I either get to add more or I get to add one and then pull out something. It's cute, right? Uh, so I, wow, nobody laughed at that. We're here to talk about message keys. <laughs> this is just depressing, you know that? <laughs> All right. In fairness, it is after a long day, so. But, um, so every time I give this talk, it's just a, just a skosh different. Uh, so I'm going to try to go through and have a good time with it. And if I hit a wall, at least I have somebody here to help me who has seen a prior version and can help unstick me. So. Uh, but I've got a few things I want to talk about today. I'm told if I move around much, they won't capture the video. So rather than be mean to them, I'll be kind of anchored here even when I'm not coding. But we're going to start off with why we use messaging platforms in the first place, where they fit in a distributed architecture. And to do that, I want to back up and do a little history. I'm a history nut. Um, and in our environment, in our field, we have computing history, which I think is fascinating because the beginning of our industry was just a few decades ago. So we don't have to reach back centuries and try to find source documents that are really hard to find and piece together stuff that doesn't fit together. We have it all. So I like history, right? But with that, let's start with the monolith, right? We'll just start there. And most of us either have or are working on monoliths, still to this day. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We kind of look at monoliths like, ugh, that's so, like, I don't know, 2000, whatever. But most of our organizations have a lot of monoliths that are still productive for making our organizations cash, right? We like cash, we like paychecks, we like to eat, we like sleeping indoors, that's generally a good thing. And that's, a, that's, that's good, right? Uh, monoliths have a lot of capabilities. Monoliths have a lot of pluses and pros. Monoliths also, like any other architectural choice, have a few negatives. And to me, the biggest negative is perhaps scalability. Um, monoliths, when you, when you look at scaling a monolith, I, I like to back up and I like to show a simple example and then build out from there, right? So, so in the example of a monolith, let's say you have an online retail establishment. We won't call it Amazon. But whatever, we'll call it something. New York Java Sig is on, I don't know, whatever. So, so we've got a monolith that provides all the capabilities of our online retail store. So what does that mean? <coughs> if I am a potential customer, I log in, or I create an account, I log in, I browse the catalog, I choose a few things that I want, I plug in my payment information, and I order it. And it tells me when those things will arrive, right? So in order to do that, what typically happens is, I go into the catalog. I choose things in the catalog and put it in the shopping cart. The shopping cart will check inventory levels and tell me if, hey, that's out of stock. We can get that, but it's back order. Or, yes, we have five of those in stock. We can ship that out today. Once you do all that, then you click order. At that point, it goes and it checks, well, you've already checked inventory, let's say, but it goes and probably it double checks inventory to make sure it hasn't sold out within that time. It checks your payment information to make sure that you just ordered $782 of widgets. Can your card accommodate $782 of charges? Oh, it can, that's great. It checks your mailing address. It checks logistics to see if it's gonna go UPS, FedEx, or what ha have you, and then it ships. It sends the virtual manifest or whatever where it needs to go, and then it, that happens. So all that's great. Let's think about though in the context, let's think about that in the context of a Black Friday sale, right? So that monolith will probably have a hard time keeping up with demand. So we need to scale it, right? So we pick that monolith up and we duplicate it. Or we create a third or a fifth or a tenth instance of it. And leaving aside the potential conflicts and, and uh, uh, issues that come about with duplicating something that was never designed to be duplicated, right? Uh, we also then have the issue of we've brought along a lot of modules, a lot of capabilities that aren't really even being used. For Black Friday, many of the things that I just mentioned are used a lot, right? But we also have a module within our online retail monolith to handle returns, we have to. Because occasionally, a customer will get something and say, I don't want that, it's the wrong size, it's the wrong color, whatever. 
those, let's say on Black Friday, once again, how much do you think that returns module is used on Black Friday? Almost not at all, right? And if you have a really good establishment, if you have a great online store, you've, you've, you've researched and got really good quality products, you have a great product market fit, you know your customer, it probably isn't used a lot anyway. But you're duplicating it, you're scaling it along with all the other modules in your monolith just the same. So you're bringing along a lot of useless baggage in this context. Obviously it's very important when you want to return something, but in this context it's dead weight. So we start realizing when we have a monolithic architecture that we're not scaling as efficiently as we could, right? We're wasting a lot of resources. And at that point we typically start looking at different alternatives. Microservices architecture comes to mind. With microservices, we can tease out those, those functionalities that we need to scale independently of everything else. And that's pretty good, right? But once we start doing that, we realize that no microservice is an island. And we realize that that order module isn't just peeled out by itself. Because that order module, again, has to check inventory levels, it has to check credit, it has to check shipping information, what have you. So we start teasing out microservices and we get a cluster of microservices that we're teasing out, not just a microservice. Which again, isn't terrible. But it also means that, at that point, the decoupling we thought we were going to get is a little bit in, incomplete, right? Because we're still coupled among those various different microservices in that small cluster. Uh, now, what it does give us is increased development and deployment velocity, in most cases, because we're actually looking at a smaller group of things that we're trying to develop and deploy rapidly versus the entire monolith. Uh, but, when we start doing that, what's the first step we typically take? We typically create microservices based around what? An HTTP-based interface, right? Typically a REST API. But when we do that, we start realizing that we've got a little more coupling going on yet. Because in most cases, what we do is we scale those kind of one-to-one. -one. So our order module, our catalog module, our order module, our logistics module, our payment module, typically when we're interacting among those, we have a certain number of requests and responses and a certain number of connections, right? So when you have you need to scale your order module to two or five or ten instances, you're typically scaling everything else to that same number of instances. Again, it's a little tighter coupling than perhaps we would like. Uh, so, with that, I want to slide into the next screen, actually. Um, anyone here of the Bezos man uh, mandate? You know, the two pizza box teams and all that stuff, and the, everything will be a service, and you know. Yeah, if you haven't heard of it, don't feel bad. If you have heard of it, I'm going to touch on it just a little bit more here. Because for something that is so widely discussed, it's hard to find. Uh, this was actually published by a former Amazonian who went to work for Google. Take out of that what you want. Uh, but he said, and, and Bezos actually specified at some point, look, our systems are brittle. In order to make a change, we have to coordinate among multiple teams. And while that's nice and we get to chat with each other, it's, it's not good. Because if I forget to mention something to you that you have to accommodate in the API or how you're querying or whatever, your stuff breaks. Maybe my stuff breaks. That's bad. So Bezos issued the mandate that everything has to be exposed as a service API. You can't sneak around my service and access my database directly or anything like that. It has to go through my service API. And the nice thing about that is it insulates changes, right? So as long as I maintain that API, I can make a lot of changes under the hood. It doesn't break anybody else's stuff, which is super. Uh, the thing I thought were couple things I thought were kind of interesting. One is he didn't specify it had to be HTTP based. Now that was a huge beneficiary of it, but he did say, hey, you can, you can use whatever mechanism you want. It's just that everybody kind of defaults to HTTP based. So take out of that what you want. Uh, but then at the end, he kind of signed off with, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. <laughs> Inertia is real. <laughs> so he knew that if he said, look, we need to move to the services based API, do it. People will come up with all kinds of reasons, and some of them very legitimate, that, hey, I will do that the next release. We've got a lot going into this release. You've told us we have to do this. It can't happen, and nothing would ever happen, right? So his point was, do it. Make it happen, or you won't be here to see the results. Sufficient, sufficient motivation does a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing, right? Now, the guy who posted this actually added a, a thing right below that. So anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Thank you. Have a nice day. Which sounds a little flippant, right? Uh, and, and when you go on and read into the guy's article, he says, ha just kidding. Jeff Bezos never said, have a nice day. You know why? Because if there's one thing Jeff Bezos doesn't care about, it's your day. <laughs> Again, I thought that was kind of interesting anecdote. Uh, but 
which probably explains why I don't work for Amazon. Anyway, so um, before I get into this, though, I do want to say that um, when you start down the microservices path and you hit the wall a little bit with the HTTP-based uh, APIs, you realize there's a lot of coupling going on. You start thinking about how could we decouple that, and message platforms give you a pretty nice capabilities in order to decouple, as well as some, some great ways to increase your scalability. The decoupling is nice because it gives you uh, temporal decoupling, locational decoupling, numerical decoupling, probably a couple others that I'm not thinking of at this point. Uh, but what do I mean by those? <clears throat> temporal in that if you are a message producer, and I, I try to stay terminology-wise above a particular implementation, above a particular messaging platform, because what happens otherwise is I create this weird gumbo among uh, RabbitMQ and Kafka and Kinesis, and it just people look at me like I'm nuts, and I am when I get into that. So I typically keep it at the term of pipeline, right? Because as a developer, that's what we care about, is getting a message into a pipeline, pulling it out of the pipeline, and consuming it, really. I mean, that's kind of really high level, but that's it. So, um, so your temporal decoupling, if you have a producer of a message that pushes a message into a pipeline, perhaps there are no consumers for that message online at that point in time. Who cares, right? If you have a durable queue, or, okay, I'm getting out of this, uh, <laughs> Dig back up. Uh, so if you have a, a way, and in most cases there is in pretty much every implementation of any kind of messaging platform, there's a way for a message to hit the pipeline, the producer, at that point, doesn't even care. It can go offline. And when a consumer comes online, guess what? It says, hey, I have a message, and it consumes it. So it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be synchronized. Numerical decoupling, because if you have one producer producing a ton of messages, and you may need two or five or 10 consumers to consume them all, you just spin up two or five or 10 consumers. And you still have that one producer, so you're not tied into direct, mostly one-to-one -one relationship. And, and locational, because you don't care where the message came from. If you're a message consumer, you just know that it's sitting in your queue, or you're sitting in your pipeline, and you grab it out. That's it. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Messaging platforms also give you the ability to implement proven routing patterns as well as maybe create a pattern that no, the world has never seen yet. It's fine, you can do that. So it gives you, again, unrivaled flexibility and power. So um, examples of leading messaging platforms, I've already mentioned RabbitMQ, I've already mentioned Kafka. I think you're hard pressed to do better than those two. Uh, they both kind of have their niches, right? Uh, Kafka is known for its crazy scalability. Rabbit is known for its crazy routing capabilities. Doesn't mean Kafka is bad at routing or Rabbit is not performant. They are both incredible, incredible platforms. Um, they also are both open source. And they also are available to be hosted on any platform, pretty much anywhere, from your laptop to a server, bare metal, VM, container, cloud hosting provider, uh, major cloud hosting provider like Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, whatever. Uh, so you have the kind of ultimate of flexibility. You also have other players from the major cloud providers, right? Um, so you have, uh, I mean, Amazon has a handful, so does Microsoft, so does Google. I like to boil it up or bubble it up to the top one. I kind of consider the first among peers. So things like Amazon Kinesis, uh, Azure Event Hubs, uh, Google's Cloud Hub Sub. Um, none of those are open source, by the way. None of those three. And that may not matter to you at all. It may be very important to you, but I like to point that out as a point of consideration. Uh, and then you have, again, RabbitMQ and Kafka. So I like to focus on those first. I consider those the first among those peers, but your mileage may vary. So uh, Spring Cloud Stream. Well, as you might imagine, one size doesn't fit all. Perhaps uh, you have some systems that are running on Rabbit, some systems that are running on Kafka. Uh, perhaps you could standardize. Maybe you've tried. And maybe you've gone so far as to put everything on Kafka, and that's great, until your company acquires another company that's standardized on Rabbit. Or you partner with somebody who's you know, put everything on Kinesis, or you have a customer who's using Azure Event Hubs. That's fine. You know, at that point, we're back in the integration game, right? And it's kind of a fact of our life. As much as we like to keep everything down to one option, which I guess then it's not an option, one thing, one choice, uh, it never happens for long. Uh, so it's really nice. It would be really nice if you had an option to abstract above that and to not necessarily care about all the details all the time. And that's what Spring Cloud Stream does for you. Um, Spring Cloud Stream doesn't stop you from getting in under the covers and, and tweaking the, the levers and knobs. You can do that. Uh, but in most cases, again, as developers, we care about putting a message where it needs to go and getting it where it needs to be and consuming it at that point. And that's what Spring Cloud Stream allows you to do without having, in most cases, to dig below the surface. 
Uh, Spring Cloud Stream is based on Spring Boot and Spring Integration. Uh, Spring Integration actually ties into a lot of things. Spring Cloud Stream focuses on messaging platforms. And Spring Boot actually gives you three above, again, kind of first knowing peers capabilities. One is simplified dependency management. One is simplified deployment. And the third is what sometimes folks derisively call magic. That's your auto configuration. And you'll see why that's such a powerful concept here in a little bit, because magic is a strong, yeah, it's a misnomer, right? Uh, I like to point to Spring Data as an example, uh, but it works the same way with Spring Cloud Stream and many other things. If you have a database driver on your class path and you extend an, imp uh, an interface in Spring Data, when your application starts, Spring Boot is smart enough to say, hey, look, you have a database driver on your class path. You have extended an interface in Spring Data. I'll bet you want to talk to a database. That's not magic, folks. That's science. It's technology. It's pretty simple stuff. But it makes sense. That's an opinion. That's why we say it's an opinionated framework. Uh, Spring Cloud Stream does the same thing. And I'll show you kind of where that plays in here in a bit. But uh, Spring Cloud Stream actually started on Spring Integration, but it's come a long way and it's evolving. So I, I have time. I'm going to show you the existing legacy API and I'm going to show you kind of a look at where we're headed with it. And I think you'll be pretty excited about it. Any, any Spring Cloud Stream users here tonight? Yeah. My twin back there is as well. I want to call him out because we're twins. As in, like, has anybody, this is Victor Gamoff. He works for Confluent. Awesome guy, by the way. Um, and I, we were, somebody pointed out earlier today on Twitter that we, our profile pictures look a lot alike. Has anyone seen, does anyone remember the Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito movie Twins? Yeah, a few of you movie buffs in here, or old people, I'm one of them, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm DeVito, okay, just in case there's any doubt on anybody's mind, he's Schwarzenegger, I'm DeVito, it's fine. Uh, but we're twins, right? So, anyway, um, let's see, where did I leave off? Oh! Binders. Binders are what makes it possible to abstract on top of this, right? Uh, because whatever you're working with, and it's similar to the, to the database driver, right? If you want to interact with Rabbit, you have a binder for Rabbit. If you want to interact with Kafka, you have a binder for Kafka. Same thing with Kinesis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that allows you to do some really cool stuff. Uh, so if you add the binder library specific to your messaging platform, provide any kind of required or desired uh, configuration settings, uh, and then you write your code to solve your real-world problem. That's as simple as that. So that's pretty nice. If you do need to get under the hood and configure Kafka replication, you still can. But in the case you don't need to, you don't have to break your head open over it. You can focus on the business problem and provide business value. OK, um, let's see. What else? Uh, I mentioned the functional API. Uh, anybody doing any reactive programming? Yeah, OK. So we have time, I think, tonight. Because uh, again, we're here till midnight. So I will probably, <laughs> kidding, only 10. Uh, so I'll probably, I am still kidding, please don't anybody leave it, um, unless you need to, and that's fine. I will probably show at least a hint of the reactive programming model uh, using uh, uh, Project Reactor, and uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Okay, and why use it? Well, again, Spring Cloud Stream handles a lot of heavy lifting for you, while still providing access to all the controls under the hood. Uh, any managers, any leadership in here? Anyone admit it? Okay, one brave soul back there who's kind of halfway raising his hand. Okay, there you go. Be proud. All right. Okay, you may want to leave the room at this point here later on during the demo. Um, <laughs> if, I mean, all kidding aside, uh, there are sometimes very valid reasons for a quick change of, of platforms, right? Or a quick change of tech stack in whatever context. Uh, there are a lot of bad reasons for that, too. And, and if you work for a manager like that, you know who you are. I'm so sorry. But there are times that these changes have to be done rather quickly. And if you haven't planned for it, if you haven't got uh, in place a, a particular framework or construct, a tool chain that allows you to do that, you're, you're hurting, right? So I'll show you how relatively easy it is to, to make that happen. Uh, that's where I said if you may want to step out, because again, uh, you guys can estimate this any way you want to, but please remember with great power, nobody's going to finish that. With, with great power. Comes great responsibility. Oh, thank goodness you're here, Jim. Okay. All right. <laughs> Another Java champion to the rescue. Thank goodness. All right. So, um, yeah. So, so you know, carefully, um, you know, when, when you're asked the scope of something, don't lie. I mean, that, that is terrible. After the first two weeks, you get off. You make it a lot more off. But if your manager decides to switch something out underneath the hood, if, if this new CTO says, hey, I, I just read an article and we need to switch everything to Kinesis, guess what? 
You can. You can switch messaging platforms entirely just by rebuilding your project with a different binder. Or if you planned ahead, you can do it dynamically, which I'll show you that as well, because I think it's a fairly small feature that is amazing when you need it. You don't need it, that's great. Good on you. If you do, super handy to have. Okay, so the first time I gave this talk, a, few, a couple of three weeks ago, I launched into code, and I had a great time. And I think the audience had a pretty good time, I think. Uh, but there were a lot of questions afterward that made me realize that I skipped kind of the context, right? Anybody use Apple Maps, Google Maps, any, any maps on your phone? Yeah, everybody does, right? So, so when you type in the address, or you speak it, depending on whether you like to do that kind of thing, I never gets my address right if I try to tell it. But if you put in the destination address and you say, give me directions, what does it do? It shows you a nice map, shows you, you go up here, turn right, go up here, turn left, 15 more circles, and then you're there, right? And then it shows you the step-by-step -step instructions. That's context. That tells you what you're about to embark upon, right? So that is what I'm gonna share here. I do wanna let you know, uh, everything I'm running, I'm running locally, just because I never know what kind of Wi-Fi connectivity I'm gonna have, so I learned a long time ago not to count on that Wi-Fi in the cloud. Uh, but if we have time, and I think we will, uh, I wanna connect to a hosted instance as well, and we'll, we'll play with that a little bit. <coughs> and that's kinda cool, right? But everything I'm running in containers locally, uh, at least initially, and when I veer from that, I'll let you know. Um, and I start off with Spring Cloud Stream and a messaging platform. I start off with RabbitMQ. I love RabbitMQ. Um, it's a great option. Nothing wrong with Kafka. We'll be switching to that later. Uh -huh. But um, I'll start off by creating a source, a processor, and a sync. And again, I'm kind of taking this down to not the simplest possible you know, configuration, but a fairly simple one, right? So a source, and, and by the way, these are interfaces that are exposed in Spring Cloud Stream by default in the existing API, right? So you have a source, that's the thing that produces values, produces messages. You have a sync, and that's the thing that consumes them. End of the line, that's, we're done, that message life cycle is over. In between, you may have one or more processors. And you can combine, mix and match these in various different ways. So you can have 15 different kinds of processors, which have a route to other processors, which split and, and recombine, and then you have a sync at the end, or syncs at the end, so on and so forth. But this is the simple example, right? I'm gonna create one of each of these, tie them together with Rabbit, then we'll roll on and we'll talk about scaling. I may switch the order up a little bit depending on convenience, but we'll talk about how you can scale actually any of them. I just like the way it presents, but you can scale your sources too, it's good. Um, and we're gonna tie those together. We'll see how that's pretty easy, easily done. Uh, if your boss comes to you and says, hey, that's great work with Rabbit, we're switching to Kafka. When can you have that done? Uh, we'll talk about how easy that is to accomplish. It's, it's super trivial, it really is. Uh, and that's really nice because it gives you the flexibility and the power that developers ought to have, right? Uh, and then if you need to integrate, it happens. We always have to, right? So if you have uh, some services, some systems in Kafka, some in Rabbit, uh, never the twain shall meet, well, they will. And it's not that hard to do either, so I'll show you that as we go. And I mentioned that this is the kind of the legacy API, the existing API. So you have a source across the certain sync. We started taking a hard look at Spring Cloud Stream several months ago and realized that this is kind of a leaky abstraction based on Spring Integration. If you know Spring Integration, a lot of this makes perfect sense. Any existing Spring Cloud Stream users? I think I asked this earlier, but I just I can't remember if hands. Not a lot. Okay. So, so you're used to an annotation-based approach, probably, sources, processors, and syncs. And by the way, you can create your own. You can create your own interfaces. All you have to do is create an interface with one or more subscribable channels, one or more message channels, and there you go. But in most cases, you can combine these in various ways, and it does that 80 to 90% of all the use cases pretty nicely. But we started realizing pretty quickly that a source of processor in a sync, and the code you had to write to, to create this mechanism, these mechanisms, was a little leaky, right? And we realized that these have parallel um, concepts at a very much lower level, even within the Java language. So a source is a supplier, right? And that's baked into Java. A supplier is a thing that creates values. A consumer, a sync is just a consumer. It consumes those values. And in between, you may have a function which transforms those values. That's all a processor does. It transforms values and passes them on. And we realized that, you know, if we can make this actually very, very Java-specific or Kotlin-specific, but language-specific and not platform and framework-specific, that leaky abstraction largely disappears. There are certain things you'll always have, some, some telltales, but certainly much, much less. And it gives you a lot more independence. 
We've increased the auto configuration around it, and again, it makes sense to do that in most ways, which I'll show you both so you can kind of see that yourself. Uh, and a few other useful bits and bobs, I think, uh, if time permits. If not, please start the repo. I'll, I'll show you two repos at the end. Uh, check them out. But with that, let's go. So does anyone recognize this gentleman? Moss. Moss. Maurice Moss, yes. If anyone doesn't recognize him, <sighs> sigh. Okay. Does anyone here who doesn't recognize him not have Netflix? Okay, one person. Gene. Gene, I was so happy earlier. You just crushed, you crushed my bubble. Okay, it is Wednesday night. You know what that means. Two more days and you have a weekend. You can binge watch the IT crowd. This is a Britcom. Uh, it's a British sitcom. Uh, that came out like seven or eight years ago, I think. And uh, it was about a small IT department of three people in the basement. They were located in the absolute bowels of, a, of an insurance company building in London. Super hilarious. Very dated now, but still, I mean, you'll watch it and you'll laugh, you'll cry, it'll feel too close to home, uh, it'll, it'll make you feel like you've got a really great gig because in some ways it's truly terrible. But this is one of the protagonists. This is Maurice Moss, and he's the, uh, the brilliant, <coughs> most brilliant of the, uh, the three. But good team. And I guess actually more than three because there are some other characters coming out. So with that, and by the way, that particular episode, there's a fire in the building and he's having to write, he's having to notify people They've just changed the 911 system, so he's sending an email to notify people there's a fire in the building. <laughs> I don't know. It's before Slack, but it still feels so raw. Okay, so we're, we'll just stop that. <coughs> and we'll flip over. Oh, I need to mirror. Oot. All right. All right. So that's not terrible. Let's blow that up. All right. So, <coughs> time to take a drink. I noticed earlier this afternoon my throat started going, my voice started going a little bit, which is terrible because I have this and then another one tomorrow evening, so I at least have to keep my voice. I'm going to be irrigating my throat frequently, which means that we may be taking a midway break to hit the bathroom, but anyway, we'll see. Um, so this is our starting point for Spring Boot-based microservices on the web. This is the Spring Initializer. You do not have to start creating Spring Boot-based microservices using the Initializer. It's just the best way, right? Um, you can actually curl this endpoint, you can HTTP it, you can use your, your IDE. Uh, you can hand write every Spring Boot based microservice you ever wanted to. Not the most productive use of your time, wouldn't recommend it, but you can, right? If it makes you happy, go for it. But uh, I like to come here because it's, uh, it's well, it's pretty. Uh, and it gives you a couple of advantages. One of which I forgot to mention earlier this afternoon. I'm going to rectify that tonight. So please remind me if, if I, if I pop out of the initializer, say, wait, 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 not so fast, okay? Okay. I'm counting on you. Okay. No pressure. Okay, all right, so, uh, for starters, this is the most important feature right here. See this? Look at that. <laughs> I know, isn't that awesome? There's dump mode for everything now. I, yeah, that's worth it all, right? Okay, so we can just break down and have coffee now, right? <laughs> okay, so if you like the light UI, that's great. I keep things pretty dark, so that's pretty nice. Um, and that's fairly new, that's like six months old, maybe tops. Uh, but that's pretty pretty sweet, right? But, um, so yeah, so this is the Spring Initializer. We'll start off here. I'm gonna keep things fairly middle of the road tonight. Um, I typically, uh, I show a lot of options, but most of them I don't choose, right? Because again, this is opinionated too. So you do still have options, even with a fairly straightforward approach. So if you are a Maven developer, if you write applications using Maven as your build, file as your uh, build system, that's great. You can create a Maven-based project. Uh, if you're a hipster, you can create a Gradle project. It's fine. I'm not judging. When I write Kotlin code, I feel really hipsterish. I have my, my hoodie on, and I use Gradle. For some reason, when I write Java code, I keep it in Maven. It just works, right? Never, never mess with stuff that, does, that works. So we're going to use a, create a Maven project using Java. I'm going to use the current version of Spring Boot, 2.2.4, but as you can see, we've got a snapshot, we've got a milestone release that's coming up that we can get the latest bits if we want them. Uh, we don't need them tonight, so I'm going to stay with that. I'm going to change the, uh, the group to thehecklers.com because I can. Uh, and then I'm going to go in here and just change one thing. Now, you can change to more packaging should you have to, should you still be using an application server, but the JAR gives you that simplified de de dependency management, the simplified deployment, rather. Um, and it also gives you nested jars. It gives you a, a super easy way to deploy. And even in those cases where you might want to expand that, it's super easy to do. 
Docker file, whatever. Uh, it's just, it's, I think it's all around this, this is a really nice packaging. Um, but here's the point that I want to call out. Uh, we like to say that we supported Java 6 after Oracle stopped, which is true, but with Java, or excuse me, with Spring Framework 5 in 2017, again, 2017, uh, we've rebaselined at Java 8. Is everyone here on Java 8 or higher? Is anyone not? I guess let me ask that. Okay, either you're terribly ashamed, and that's fine, you know, I've been there, um, or you're not. So that's good, if that's, if that's the case. So we baselined at Java 8, and if you're on Java 8, that's great. 8 is great. Gosh, I feel like Mark Reinhold. Uh, but 11 is the most recent long-term supported release. So if you're on 11, that's even better, right? Uh, I'm going to use Java 13 because we always support the latest version as well. 14 is in early access, so pretty soon that'll flip to 14, and that's fine. But we'll stay with 13 tonight. Whatever you want to do, though, whatever you need to do, that's cool. So I'm going to just uncollapse that. And then I'm going to choose some dependencies. So I'm going to start off with Reactive Web, uh, which gets us our reactive capabilities. We don't have to create reactive services with this when I include this dependency, but we can. And I, again, we should have time to do that. Uh, so I'm also going to bring in Spring Cloud Stream dependency, which gives you a little hint right here. It says, look, you're wanting to connect to a messaging platform. To do so requires a binder like Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ. So the next thing we should probably add is something like RabbitMQ or Kafka, right? So I added those dependencies. Not bad. Uh, oh, and I forgot Lumba. this Lumba. afternoon. I forgot Actuator earlier. Oh my gosh, I was going to show that. Well, tonight. OK, are you keeping a tally? Yeah. OK, good. All right. So she was here this afternoon. So I'm picking on her because one, she was crazy enough to come back. And I know there are some others of you who are, are as well. But you have the good judgment to not sit up front. So this is on you. I'm sorry. But, uh, OK, so I'm also going to add in Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Lazy good, not lazy bad. Um, anybody using Lombok? Anybody using Lombok in production? Oh, Okay. You better you better keep to yourself the comments now. <laughs> okay. Why not switch them over? See now that's what always happens. Okay. Um, I I okay. More times I cared admit I've made the offhand comment that I typically don't recommend Lombok in production. People freak out. They're like, why? We just put it into production. Um, Lombok has a bad habit of changing things on dot releases. It's not the end of the world. It breaks builds, you go in, you find, oh great, Lombok 1.8.4, change this, now value doesn't provide an orcs instructor or whatever. you. So now we have to change things. It's not a big deal, it's a quick change, life goes on, until the next breaking change on a dot release. After a while, it just gets a little annoying. It's not a big deal, Lombok's an excellent library, I like it, I use it in all my demos because it allows me to focus on stuff that I want to focus on. I'm just not sure that I would put that into production. Spring, all the various Spring projects have extricated Lombok from it just because of that, and the fact that you have to have a plugin in your IDE. Again, not the end of the world, just a couple data points, right? Okay, but I'm lazy, so here we have it. <laughs> and then I'm also going to add an actuator because uh, that lets me show you very quickly just uh, some of the, the metrics and gauges that you can see in terms of your Spring Cloud stream via actuator, which again, forgot to show at all yesterday, or this afternoon. So I'm going to generate this project, but before I do, Connie, you don't have to remember this one now. Just actuator. Um, the one other reason, because somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, it's like, why do you recommend we go through here, Spring Initializer? Because his company had created this really cool tool, which you plug in some information, it generates your project, it checks it into source control, blah, 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 you know, everything's going good, everything's great, and it does a lot of things for you. But this was added, I don't know, eight months ago. So if you've ever created a Spring Boot project and you're like, oh, I forgot to add a dependency, or oh, I wonder what it would look like if I did added this one, or whatever, you, you would have to create the project, download it, <coughs> unzip it, pull it up in your IDE, pull it up in VS Code, whatever, and you'd look at it and you'd see what the dependencies were. Now you can just click a button here. You don't have to go to any of that trouble. You just click a button and it shows you, here are all the dependencies that I'll get. That's pretty nice, right? That's a great feature, and it's just a... It's not a big feature, it's just a terribly handy feature. So you didn't even have to generate the project, it just, it's there. So let's go ahead and we'll save this. I'm going to actually put this out here, save it. And then again, because I'm lazy, oh, I left that on demo. Silly me, no, that's fine. We'll just create a source. I'm gonna create a source, a processor, and a sync. Processor, and I have to click. 
once I expand that, it doesn't seem to want to go back, so I need to log that as an issue and get it fixed when I get back. <laughs> okay, so I've created all three. Actually, I'm just go here, and we'll go and unzip our source, and we'll open that. And by the way, the Spring Initializer does not generate code for you. I mean, it, it allows you to choose your dependencies, it zips everything up, and your build file sends it down. Uh, what it does do is create your project structure, and it does, I guess, create your uh, your main application class main method, but that's it. Everything else is up to you. Um, but I opened this in my favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> Get a, oh my, tough room. Okay, any NetBeans users here? Did I just offend half the room? Okay. I pick on my friends, you should know this. Uh, NetBeans is an awesome IDE, it has great Spring support. So if you're using NetBeans and happy with NetBeans, all good. Uh, any Eclipse users here? Uh, Eclipse is also a... Um, it's an IDE. Eclipse is also an IDE. <laughs> yes, it is. I, I've used Eclipse at customer sites and with certain projects, and I find it's sort of like the, the, the funny you know, GIF. It's GIF, by the way. It's never GIF. It's a GIF. But it's, it's like the GIFs of the Swiss Army knife with 500 blades. You know Eclipse can do it, but you can't find the right blade anywhere. It's, it's in there, but it's tough to find, right? I've never developed a great fondness for Eclipse. That said, uh, we have a language server that plugs into Eclipse and to Atom VS Code, which gives you some really cool cloud deployment capabilities as well as other things. So, I mean, it is, I mean, that's pretty sweet. Um, but, uh, again, I use IntelliJ because it fits my workflow better. I also love Kotlin. Uh, so, the folks who make IntelliJ are JetBrains. The folks who lead development of Kotlin are JetBrains. So, as you might imagine, support is quite good. Um, but do what makes you happy. Use anything you want. Use VS Code, use Atom, use Vim. Just for whatever reason, whatever your choice, please, please, please do not use Emacs. Have some self-respect. All right, so I'm going to open up my application properties. Tough crowd, again, must be Emacs fans. Okay, so let's see. Wow, I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. I put it on high contrast already because I think that kind of pops. I'll put this up to ambiguous. And that gets us what we should have there. And then I'm going to open, nope, uh, let's see. There we go. All right, so here's where we start. And that's all the screen initializer gives us. But it's a good start, right? So every time you do a demo, and any time you like, show something, you have to have some kind of a domain, right? An example that you can write. And uh, a little bit of life advice, right? They always tell you, do what you love. And I thought, that should apply to demos too, right? So I love coffee, so we're going to do a demo about coffee. Why not? Um, I actually went to Medellin, Colombia last year and toured a coffee plantation. If you've never toured a coffee plantation, it is life-altering. If you love coffee. If you don't start drinking coffee, then go. Then it's life-altering. Uh, it was really cool because we got to go out and pick the beans, brought them in. Um, they sort them using this kind of waterfall trough, right? So they throw all the beans in there, they, they, they stick gates in the way. And they're different heights. And the beans, the, the tiny beans, the mid-grade beans, and the really good beans, they all float differently. So it, it separates the really good ones, which then they'll typically roast and sell under their brand. Makes sense, right? The good stuff. Then they have the mid-grade. And that's the stuff they sell to other places, which package and roast, roast package and stuff and sell under their name. Then they have the really cruddy, tiny little sad ones. Those are the supermarket brands, right? So, so it's kind of cool to see how they do it, but they sort them all with this water trough, and then they roast them, package them, and on and on. So it's pretty neat operation. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could create a series of microservices that kind of mirror that transitions from the, from the coffee grower to the coffee packager and roaster to the coffee drinker to our coffee shops so that we get our premium jet fuel the way we like it, strong and tasty, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna start off, we're gonna create a class here, and this will be our uh, wholesale coffee class. And I'm gonna create a pretty simple, right? I just want a couple of fields here, like ID and name. Uh, and then of course, again, since I'm using Lomlock and I'm lazy, I'm just gonna have this uh, be my data class with a knowledge constructor. Now, these are annotations from Lombok. At data just says, uh, for the, two or three handful of Kotlin developers here. This is like a Kotlin data class to some degree. But Lombok at data just says, hey, give me my getter setters equals hash code and two string methods. Done. 
and it's consistent. Right? That's nice. Uh, then you have an all args, all args constructor uh, annotation, which I'm using here, and that just instructs Lombok to provide a constructor with a, a parameter for each one of my member variables. So it has a parameter for ID and it has a parameter for name in a single constructor, all args constructor. So that's kind of nice. Now, um, that's cool, right? Uh, and that gets us our domain. Now, this is our source. I'm starting with the source, and the source is the thing that produces values. So I could produce those values. I could tell the source, hey, send a value. Hey, send another value. Hey, send another value. But that sounds like a lot of work, and I'm lazy. So I'm going to create a component here, component, and we're going to uh, have this be our coffee generator, right? And I'm going to create a couple of properties here. So a list of strings, strings, come on. Sometimes IntelliJ doesn't keep up. I have no idea why. So I'm going to create a list of a few different coffee types. Anybody have a favorite coffee? Java. <laughs> For some reason, that's everybody's favorite, right? So Java. That's the first thing. French roast, somebody said French roast. Roast. I can't type tonight. It's been a long day, a month this week. Uh, yes, somebody else? Blend. Breakfast blend. Breakfast blend, right? Breakfast blend. Blend. <laughs> okay, there we go. Anyone else? Turkish. Turkish. Turkish, that's good. I like Turkish coffee. Strong. <laughs> Cafe Cubano, maybe? Bulletproof. Also strong. Why? <laughs> Chandra Bing! All right. So, so you're probably wondering why I called him out, so. Um, hold on. Chandra. Chandra. It's bulletproof. Okay. So a few days ago, or was it just yesterday? It feels like just yesterday. On Twitter, uh, somebody mentioned something about coffees. And I, I am opinionated too, right? In, in a good way, I think, by and large. Um, I am fond of coffee. And I personally drink coffee for medicinal purposes, right? For medical reasons, because I need it to survive and cope. So I'm not a recreational coffee drinker at all. So, okay, maybe a little. But anyway, I enjoy my medicine. Um, so somebody mentioned, was it you, Chandra, who brought this up, or was it somebody else? Oh, no, thank you, buddy. Okay, bulletproof coffee. Bulletproof coffee has, it's this terrible concoction people put butter in. <laughs> For starters, butter and coffee, really? I mean, that's just, no. Secondly, the more of anything else you put into your cup of coffee besides coffee, the less caffeine per ounce you have. <laughs> this is counterproductive and stupid. I get it. It's not stupid. But it doesn't seem like the best idea. So, so I went off on Twitter, because that's what Twitter is for, right? Rants. That's why you should follow me. Because I'm generally fun with the occasional coffee rant. Uh, but... Anyway, so bulletproof coffee for those who imbibe, for the rest of us, just some good stuff. Okay, anyone else? By once? Costa Rica. Costa Rica? Okay, yeah. Costa Rica. Okay, and actually in honor of the, uh, the, the one, uh, the coffee plantation I went to, Cafe Cereza, if I can type, Cereza. And just for good measure, we'll just add the accent. All right, sweet. All right, that gets us a start, right? And then I'm going to uh, add a little bit of randomness in here, equals new random, because random is fun. All right, so now we need something that will create our wholesale coffees. We'll create a method called generate, cleverly enough. We'll return a new wholesale coffee, if I can type. Uh, we'll use UID to generate a random UID string for our ID, and then we will take our names and get, and we'll take our randomness, this is a randomness, and we use our name size to generate a value, and Bob Jericho, we now have a random coffee. Now we just need to get it into the pipeline, right? So uh, let's do that. So we're going to legacy API. We'll do the legacy API first. So uh, at enable binding, right? And we're going to bind to our source class. And I, again, lazy, so I'm gonna enable scheduling. So I can just have this tick off every so often and send a, a message. And then I'm going to create our class called uh, Coffee Rower. I'm then going to inject our uh, coffee generator. Now, <coughs> pardon me. In Spring, there are many ways you can inject an object into whatever class you're, you're creating. So you can do field injection. Field injection is evil. Uh, there's a great article about this by Oliver 
Dirk at the time, now he goes by Oliver Dropbaum, head of Spring Data at the time, uh, cleverly entitled, or titled, Why Field Injection is Evil. I would encourage you to Google that and read it. It's really good. He, he makes some very cogent arguments for that. Uh, so typically what we do, we recommend that you uh, use constructor injection. That's kind of the preferred way, right? So we could create our own constructor, or again, being lazy, I'm going to ask Lombok to do that for me with add all large constructor. This is a member variable, and guess what? It just created our constructor for us, so we will. So at this point, we need to get these values into the pipeline. So I'm going to uh, schedule a method here with a fixed rate of one per second, 3,000 milliseconds. And we're going to say send coffee. Sounds like a plea for help, right? And I do need to do one more thing, which is to inject our source so we can get direct access to it. So then I can take our source object, our source bean, use the output channel, because this is a source that has an output only channel. It doesn't have an input channel by default, right? Because it's the source. It's where messages originate. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, send a message. I'm gonna use our friend the message builder to, uh, to create a payload here using our generator to generate that. And we'll build our message and send it. Super easy, we just created a source just in minutes. Now, in order to do anything with that, of course, we need something to catch the messages on the other end. So that's our next stop. Uh, so I'm gonna to go to my processor, we'll open that up, and we'll pull that up again in NetBeans, kidding, uh, IntelliJ. And let's see, I'll close that, and we'll open our application properties. Oh, I did forget to do that, didn't I? I did, so let me go back to that. So we've created our application code, um, but in a Spring Boot-based project, you have an application.properties file, or an application.yaml, should you choose to YAML. Uh, what that allows you to do is cer set certain sensible defaults for your application to start up with, right? And you can externalize that, uh, you can have um, environment variables that it draws from, and there's a very specific order, so you can override any of these live, which I'll show you here in a bit as well, because I think it's a pretty powerful concept. Again, small thing, big power coming out the other end. But I'm gonna set a few certain, a few sensible defaults. I'm gonna set my server port equal to zero. And what that does upon startup, Spring Boot looks for an available random port and assigns it. So I don't have port conflicts when I'm running all these services locally, which is kind of nice. And then I'm going to uh, define my Spring Cloud Stream bindings. Uh, this is an output. And I'm going to set the destination for these messages to a channel, a, I shouldn't say channel, a pipeline, we'll call it, called processor, right? And then I need to do something else. And this is one thing that I need to back up and look at the pump. Because as I mentioned, with Spring Boot-based projects, you have auto configuration. So if I create a Spring Cloud Stream project and I say, look, I want to deal with Kafka. And I have the Kafka binder and I have my Kafka driver in there. It says, I got this. I'll do this. I'll handle this. And it provides a, all of the beans necessary to make that happen under the covers. You can override them. You can disable that, you can create all your own, but in 99% of the cases, you don't have to. But it requires a certain degree of specificity. And as you might recall, I included binders for Rabbit and Kafka, which means that Spring Boot's gonna take a look at that and it's gonna say, you're not giving me enough information to go on. Which do you want? So we need to do something here, right? And it's pretty simple, you just set the binder, in this case, to Rabbit. That's it. That's kind of nice. Uh, I'm also going to define some Kafka properties, so I don't have to come back to those later, because I frequently do forget, as you probably likely witnessed by now. And I'm going to set the auto-add partitions to true, which means that I, uh, the Spring Cloud Stream will actually spin those up for me. As a developer, that's kind of nice. It gets me up and running faster. And I'm going to set a minimum partition count equal to four. I'm also going to, because I want to, if I remember, we remember, uh, show you just a hint of the actuator, uh, things that you can see in actuator from Spring Cloud Stream. So I'm gonna choose the web, uh, the management endpoints, the web exposure to include everything. Now, pause for just a moment. <coughs> Most of the time when I write code and share it publicly, I try to represent good practices, right? I'm not fond of the term best practices because best practices, if they ever exist, are ephemeral, right? <laughs> Tomorrow they're not the same best practices. But I try to follow good practices. When I deviate from that, when I take a shortcut that is dangerous or ill-advised, I usually stop the press and tell everyone, this is one of those times, right? Because Actuator will expose a lot of information about your applications. And that's 
a lot of information that you don't necessarily want the bad guys to see. Somebody who's probing, somebody who's just like, oh, there's an application deployed out here, and I can see that. Let's see what the environment is. Let's see what the, whatever the beans are that it's loading. It gives them a lot of information about your environment that you may not necessarily want to share. Sure. So you should choose, pick and choose what endpoints you want to expose. It's also integrated with Spring Security, where you can secure those endpoints. I'm doing none of that tonight. I'm just kicking down the door and saying, show us everything. Do not, please, please, please do not do this in production. <laughs> this is just because it's easier and faster tonight. Okay, now we've covered that. We can, we can carry on. <laughs> but I just, I like to cover that because I don't want to set a bad example and, and people don't realize it's, it's a terrible example, so. Okay, so back to our processors. Our source created what? It created wholesale coffees and it's pushing them into a pipeline. So we know that we're going to be receiving wholesale coffees, unless something is seriously wrong. So wholesale coffee and private final string ID and name, and that's cool. And then of course, this is our transformer, right? Our processor takes wholesale coffees and turns them into what? Retail coffees. So we're going to clean them, roast them, what have you. Uh, so private final string ID and name, because those still apply. Uh, oh yes, Lombok, at data, at alerts instructor. And that's cool, uh, but we also need to indicate what state these coffees are in when we send them out to our coffee, our retail establishments. So really, there's only one true state that we should be creating coffee to send out, right? And that's whole bean. Those true coffee drinkers among us know that it's best, it's freshest when you grind it right before you brew it. But there are some of us who travel, who have a terribly short window from the time we wake up to the time we have to hop on our train in the morning, and that's fine. We'll produce a few ground <coughs> packages of ground coffee for, for us, right? But it's certainly not optimal. It is what it is. So, uh, so now we have a, a private uh, final state, right? So we have a state represented here in our retail coffee. And now we need to enable binding to what? This is our processor. Uh, doo -doo -doo, class, and here we have our coffee. This is our coffee roaster. Roaster. Once again, I like a little bit of randomness to inject into things just for fun, equals new random, and here we go. So I'm going to uh, indicate that I have a stream listener. It's going to be listening to our processor.input channel. And then it's going to turn around and transform our wholesale coffee into a retail coffee, and it's going to send that out to our processors.output channel. Super simple, right? And we're, we have a, we're producing a retail coffee, Oh, I have retail coffees. Silly, silly, silly. Boom. Okay, so we have retail coffee, and we'll say this is process it. And we'll receive a wholesale coffee. Uh, w coffee. Okay, so return new retail coffee. Uh, and actually, yeah, that's cool. All right, so uh, w coffee dot get ID, w coffee dot get name, and we'll use our random dot next int. Uh, there are two values, right? So if the value equals zero, uh, we'll return our state dot whole bean. If not, we'll return our state dot ground. Nice. Okay. So that's pretty simple, right? Not bad. Okay. So let's see. Actually, you know, what? just to make this monitorable, so we can see this, uh, retail coffee or coffee equals. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And then we'll just do an R coffee dot salt, which is a nice shortcut in IntelliJ, and return R coffee. Sweet. Okay. Now we go back here, and once again, server port zero, Spring Cloud Stream binding. Oops, uh, binding. Uh, we have an input channel, destination, and again, this was coming to a pipeline called processor. We also can specify a group. Now, if you don't specify a group, that results in every processor getting every copy of every message. And if you want to implement a fan out pattern, that's how to do it. It's a, it's a valid pattern, right? If you need everybody to receive all the same messages, that's a fan out. But if you want to scale, you assign them to the same group. And that's how you implement a competing consumer pattern, because it's a consumer group. So if you have two or five or 10 instances, they all take turns, right? And that means you can scale two or five or 10 times, roughly, to the number of messages you can handle. And that's fine. We again need to specify our binder, which is rabbit to start off with, and our bindings for our output channel. Uh, we have a destination of, we'll call this sync. We don't need a group here because it's not, a, we don't need to specify a consumer group. 
on a producer channel, right, or output channel, but we do need to indicate once again that we're going to be using Rabbit for that. And then again for later, Kafka uh, auto add partitions true, and our Kafka minimum partition count four, if I can hit the keys, and once again for our actuator. So that's it, right? So now we just go and create our, our sync. And I'm just going to delete that demo. There we go. We get our sync, open that up. And by now you kind of know the drill. We're going to go to our application properties. We're going to go to our application class. And at this point, our processor does what? It takes in wholesale coffees. It produces retail coffees. So that's exactly what we're going to be expecting in our sink is retail coffees, right? Uh, class retail coffee, you know, state, whole bean or ground, and private file string, ID or name, ID and name, and a state, state. Perfect. All right. Boom. All right. So now, we do an enable binding. In this case, we're binding to our sink. And here we have our class. This is our coffee drinker. Finally, the payoff, right? OK. So at this point, we once again say stream listener. Uh, this is our sync.input, right? Input channel. And we're receiving our, I'll we'll just call it drink it. We're receiving our retail coffee, our coffee. And let's just do our coffee.sout. Boom. There we go. Oh, I do actually need to go back here. So report zero, Spring Cloud Stream Bindings input channel, because this is all a sync has is an input channel. Destination, it's called sync, group, sync. Binder, again, is rabbit. And then, yeah, Kafka will launch the, into the Kafka partition settings, auto add partitions true, and minimum partition count four, and our actuator, boom. Okay, so let's run this. So what, in 10 minutes, roughly, 15 maybe, we created three different microservices. We're going to tie to uh, an underlying messaging platform. That seemed to work. Let's go for, uh, for two. And this is our processor. So I'm going to start that. So for those of you who have used Spring Cloud Stream, this looks pretty familiar, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about your stream listeners, your send tos, your your annotations for enable binding. Uh, this is nothing that's, that's new at this point. This is all pretty pretty consistent, pretty familiar territory. Uh, so, so our source is started. We go pull up over here our processor, right? And we see that we're coming out with values. Let's go to our sync and make sure our sync is receiving them. Life's looking pretty good at this point. So that's all right. But this is the evolution. Uh, and I'm going to, this is something I'm pretty excited about. So, uh, this, what we're trying to do is both increase the auto configuration, decrease the leaky abstraction. And I'm going to uh, basically just get rid of all this, right? Boom. And we're going to rewrite this using our new functional API. So I'm going to, and I don't have to do this. I, uh, with the Spring Boot application annotation, you actually have a configuration class that can lump it up there. But I like to maintain a little bit of a separation of concerns here. So I'm going to create our coffee rower class as an act, a configuration class. And then I'm going to create a bean. And our bean will be a supplier, right? We'll provide a supplier of wholesale coffees. Send coffee. All right, now I will, because I still need my coffee generator. And I still need Lombok to provide that for me, because again, I'm still lazy. And this is pretty simple, right? So. A supplier is what? A su well, let's just go look at it, right? So we'll pull this up and look. Um, where did that go? I must have hit a weird key. I did. OK, so what's a supplier? A supplier is a functional interface with a single abstract method. Since Java 8, what have you been able to do when you have a functional interface with a single abstract method? Lambda. lambda. Yeah, this is so cool, right? So we're going to supply a lambda right here. So return, and let's see, we just want to do a generator to generate, right? That's it. It's so easy. That's it. So that's kind of nice. 
that's, that's a lot less leaky. We don't have a lot of our stuff that's encroaching coming from screen integration, and it's clean. So let's go and look at our processor now, because I think we can do better than this in our processor as well. And I'm just going to kind of edit this in place. So I'm going to change this to an app configuration, right? And I'm going to leave my random there, because I love my random. Get rid of those. Now, at this point, I can just do, this is a function, right? So I'm going to take in values of wholesale coffee and produce values of retail coffee. Don't need this, right? So a function, any guesses what a function is? It's a functional interface with a single abstract method. Our friend Lambda comes back into to being here. So at this point, what we can do is, um, let's see, we'll just do a uh, return and we'll take in a wholesale coffee, right? Coffee, and we will produce, well, we'll produce this. So I'm just going to do this. There we go, and that's pretty simple, right? And I can clean this up just a little bit, but again, this is pretty tight. Um, I've got my screen, my font set kind of high, but but it's, uh, it's pretty clean. And there's nothing here that necessarily says, hey, look, this is Spring Cloud Stream. It's just a Java function. So should you change implementations? It's pretty clean and simple to do that. Now, um, I do need to do one other thing with this. And actually, I kind of forgot about this here in my uh, Sim Coffee. Because I have, and this is something that's a little weird if you're not used to it. Because these channel names, input and output, that implies what? a single input channel and a single output channel. And again, you can override these, you can, you can create your own interface, you can have multiple inputs and outputs, but this makes this pretty sweet because what I do now, or what we can do, is just take that send coffee method, we have an output channel and we have zero, which implies what? We can have a lot of these. And the cool thing is we started on the reactive side with this, so we can actually use tuples, right? So we have by functions, we have tuples, uh, and this is getting pretty exciting at this point, and it's just kind of getting started, to be honest with you. So, so this allows us to set up a lot more flexible um, channels, if you will. How many channels can you set up? I, I have to look this up, because I, we were talking eight initially um, with the idea, I mean, the, as soon as you mention a number, people are like, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's kind of what we're thinking of right now. We support uh, by functions, and then we're, we've got the, like, I think we're up. I think eight is the current max, um, but stay tuned because that may or may not change. If you have any questions about this stuff, by the way, uh, get her to IM. It's where all the Spring team hangs out. That's where you have the community that hangs out in the various different channels. So if you start working through some of these, you're more than welcome to ping me on Twitter, DM me if you don't want to publish things publicly. That's fine, uh, or just hop on Getter uh, because we have somebody kind of around the clock around the globe watching that at all times. So that's kind of a little extra before I forget that. But anyway, so we've got our output channel set up here. We're going to do the same thing with process it, which allows me to show you some cool stuff down the road. Uh, we're going to take our input channel and change that to process it in zero. And Is then we'll zero take, required? I'm sorry? Is the zero required? It, it is because the idea is that you can define zero to n in this case. Uh, and zero means that you literally have one because zero offset. Um, and I don't want to say it's required because there is a way to alias and still keep your input and output. And if you're migrating an existing application, you may do that. Uh, but typically what happens is that once you bite the bullet and do a global search and replace once, then you're done. And that gives you a lot more flexibility down the road. So um, it's useful if you have to make a quick change and you want to migrate to that and don't want to go to much more trouble, but I don't see that it's incredibly useful, I guess, to be really honest with you. It's a neat capability, but it's probably more of a parlor trick that won't last. So, um, Okay, so output, and this is our output channel, so there we go. And then, since we've done that, and let's go to our sync. The sync is super simple, we'll just take this and make this in that configuration class. Change this to an at bean, which I hope I've been doing that as I go on these. Change it to a bean. I didn't. Off of my head. Okay, so bean. And go back here. And we got a bean. Okay, the reason that's important is because if you create a supplier bean for a Spring Cloud Stream application, Spring Cloud Stream's auto configuration can say, look, you have a supplier, this is a source. 
you have a function, this is a processor, you have a consumer, this is a sink. So you just have to create that beam and it takes care of it, which is pretty nice as well. Consumer, and this is a consumer of retail coffees, right? And we don't have to pass that in as a parameter anymore. And then we just do a return again, lambda, right? So we have our coffee, coffee, and we do a system, wow, typing is going down how fast. Print line, and this is our coffee. But of course, we can just change this to a method reference, and there we go. So we have our drink it. Let's go and change our input. Input to drink it in zero. Sweet. All right, so let's go ahead and restart that. This is the functional API, and this is kind of the way of the future. Because again, this is neat, clean, and you don't have to add anything really to speak of. You just make these simple Java functions, processor, or functions, consumers, or suppliers. So there's our sync. We go back to our processor, we restart that. So that's up and running. Let's go back to our source and we'll start that. And then we'll go watch. So here's our processor. We see that we're still connecting to Rabbit, and boom, we're getting our coffees. We get our sink, we're still getting our coffees. Sweet, right? Now, that, so far I've shown you the existing legacy API and the functional, the new functional API. That's great, but we're still talking imperative, right? Uh, how many people have worked with reactive programming, reactive uh, uh, streams? Okay, so just a really quick kind of summary for those of you who haven't. And that's cool, there are a lot, there are a lot, a lot of systems out there that are still using Imperative Java, and probably will be for the foreseeable future. Um, what Reactive Streams gives you is crazy scalability, right? It can, can lead to some performance gains. In certain instances, it can be a slight performance uh, you know, de degradation. But in most cases, it actually gives you a little bit of a performance gain and crazy scalability, which is why it's a nice natural fit when you're talking about messaging platforms. The thing that we're lacking at this point is reactive drivers for those messaging platforms. So uh, Kafka still, uh, Rabbit still, you have some capabilities in terms of exposing reactive streams publishers, but you don't have a true push all the way through uh, the pipeline. You still have to request a value, right? Or a series of values. But we'll get there. We're, I mean, it's all in progress. But what it allows you to do is to take each of those microservices and use reactive programming for those. So if you're, you're uh, for instance, at the front end and you're pushing those values via web API, it allows you to scale that a lot better. If you're consuming them at the other end and exposing those via web API, it gives you that capability as well. So it gives you a lot of, at this point, a lot of value, a lot of scalability on the ends, but not so much in the middle. Again, we'll get there. Uh, so if you want to convert from an imperative model to a reactive streams model, oh, I should actually say, the reason that's so important is because in the old days when you were looking at Im improving your scalability, we looked at asynchronous programming. Anybody done asynchronous programming? Yeah. You were thrilled to do it, right? Great stuff, lots of fun. Nothing ever went wrong. Callback hell. There's a term called callback hell. I'm convinced that was coined by an optimist, right? Uh, because once you have a certain number of callbacks, when you say, when you're done with this, call this method. When you're done with that, call this. It gets really, really ugly, unmaintainable, hard to follow, so on and so forth. Uh, the other thing that asynchronous programming, asynchronous code, doesn't have is a way to push back, to apply back pressure. Because what happens is, uh, when it, a, a supplier of values has a ton of values it pushes down downstream, if the consumer can't keep up, what happens? Typically, the consumer just falls over, which is not good, right? Uh, with ace, with uh, reactive programming, with reactive streams-based publishers, what happens is you have back pressure. So if you have a slow consumer, an iPhone client three states over with a shaky internet connection, uh, maybe it's operating on cell, uh, that slower consumer can say, look, I can't handle all that you're probably going to want to give me. Just give me 10 values. And then it accepts those 10 values, and then it processes them, and then it says, okay, I'm done with those. Give me 10 more. Now another 10, or 100, or whatever, 500. But it allows that slower consumer to not be overwhelmed 
and just fall over and die, right? It doesn't change the fact that if you have a super fast producing uh, producer that's producing a lot of values, a thousand per second, that, that slow consumer that can only handle 10 per second, it doesn't change the fact you have a disconnect, but what it does is shift the power back to your cloud service where you have control. You don't necessarily always have control over that iPhone client three states away. So it's, it's somewhat useful, right? Um, so the whole concept is that uh, with, with the Reactive in, uh, Streams initiative is to allow various different industry players to kind of sign up to the, to the basics, right? We agree there's a problem, we agree that it typically happens in the interactions, uh, but we may not necessarily have the same kind of implementation. However, they should be interoperable. Whatever our implementations are, they should interoperate. And they should be verifiably interoperable, right? So the Reactive Streams Initiative has four different things. One's the specification itself, the textual spec. One's the, um, the API. One's the TCK, arguably the most important, because that's how you check to see how compliant you are. And then fourth is the examples and how to implement. And, and to implement these, it's, it's not, it's bigger than the bread box, right? Because there are a lot of concerns you have to take into account. So you can create your own, and you can verify everything, or you can use an existing library, something like RxJava, Vertex, Aka Streams, or Project Reactor. And most of the major players have been kind of coalescing around Project Reactor. That's something that Pivotal started, um, but it's certainly not ours, or VMware now. Um, I mean, there's a lot of cross-pollination and cooperation that goes on in the field. One of our lead contributors is David Carnock, who you may recognize as the name, who's the lead developer of RxJava. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a good field, right? And we get along pretty well. Um, but what that allows you to do is have a potentially different implementation that still is fully interoperable, verifiably interoperable because of the TCK. It tells you where you've fallen short or if you're 100%. And it allows you to carry on, regardless of the choices you make now or what you're dealing with. Um, but the reactor approach was very similar to the Java approach. Because the idea for Spring, when we looked at implementing reactive streams and reactive programming in Spring was not to throw away all the stuff that's worked so far in Spring MVC, it's to create a parallel set of capabilities that closely mirror, right? So there's very low learning curve, there's very little friction when you're switching back and forth. And in the Java space, if you have a method that returns something, what does it return? Typically it returns, let's say, a single object of type T, right? Or maybe an iterable of type T. So it's one or some, right? And in the reactor team, we felt like, hey, look, this kind of makes sense to mirror that philosophy. So instead of having a, a stream, a publisher, is, if you will, a reactive streams publisher, that can return an unknown number of things, we'll say that we can have, we'll specialize that publisher into a mono, which returns zero or one, at most one, so it's like an, an object of type T, if you will. And then you have a flux, which can be zero to N. That can, that's your many. And that can be either a a small collection, like eight or 10 values, or it could be an indefinite number of values over an indeterminate amount of time. And that may be like one per second, it may be one today, five tomorrow, 500 the next day, three the next day, two weeks, and then another one comes in. And that's what I typically refer to as a sporadic publisher, but it's all there, it's all capable of dealing with those. Oops, wake up. Okay, so, am I charging? Yes, I am. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't on, uh, on the laptop's battery because I've done that before and it's ended badly. So, uh, so you have a, a mono or a flux, typically, and that's a reactive stream. And that gives you the ability to deal with streams of values instead of an individual value at a time. So you can have a supplier here that will process a flux, a flux of wholesale coffees, right? Go on. Typing has really gone downhill. There we go. Uh, we need to change this slightly, right? So we'll just create a, uh, do a flux.interval, which will create a flux at a predefined inter interval, a duration of one second in this case. So every second it will produce a pulse, just a ping, right? That's a long value, and we'll map that ping to uh, generator.generate. So every second it'll just call that method. Now that's okay, but again, remember one of the advantages of reactive streams implementations is that they can accommodate back pressure and you should always plan for back pressure now if we're only sending a value once per second we're probably not going to overwhelm anybody right but it's a good practice to get into to define what happens when you have back pressure so you can drop the intervening values if you have a dashboard and you only care about the snapshot in time drop them it's all right you don't care what happened three hours ago 
Uh, if you want to buffer them, if you want to set your buffer size, you can do a lot of different things to control what happens to those intervening values. All of these things have trade-offs, right? I'm just going to drop the values for now. Not that we'll really drop any, because again, one per second. But it's a good habit to get into, even if you do nothing more than just say, on back pressure drop, always specify that. So now we're dealing with a supplier of a flux of wholesale coffees. Uh, here we can do the same thing. We have a function in our processor, which will produce a flux of wholesale coffees, or excuse me, take in a flux of wholesale coffees, produce a flux of retail coffees. We need to tweak this just a bit. So we have return, and this is a flux. We'll take our flux and we'll map each of our values here. And let's see, so, um, doo -doo -doo. yes, that should be right. Boom, boom, boom. That looks heavy. Okay, so that's good. So now it's really that simple, right? So there's not a lot of, of cognitive overhead to switch. Now, the, the thing that I'm looking at here, and I want to share, is that you've got a flux, and you're mapping each value that comes through that flux to another value. You're transforming that, right? But you're, again, operating on it as a reactive stream. So if you've used the streams API since Java 8, this looks very familiar, right? Your maps, your flat maps, your 4-H, your, your processing as a stream, and that's exactly what you're doing here. It's just an extension of something you're familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it, this is a great reason to get familiar with it, right? Uh, so that's done. And again, for our consumer, we'll take a flux of retail coffees. All right, come on, IntelliJ. Keep up. There we go. And here we'll do, so this is a flux. So we take our flux, and we do a flux.subscribe, system.out. We'll restart that. We'll go back to our processor. We'll restart that. And then we'll go back to our source and we'll optimistically restart that because what could possibly go wrong with live coding sources or processors you're running sinks running sources down running so that we go out here and we see that it's all still working that's pretty good right so far so good now i promised you i would show you something that's really i think super cool it's just a small feature but i think it's really nice in the past, with the existing Spring Cloud Stream, if you had to have multiple transformations, if you wanted to do any complex processing in a processor, for instance, uh, what you did was you created this one long method, right? And it did this, and it did that, and it did the other thing, and it did it as a unit, right? And everything that came in was transformed the same, and it, it went through this whole thing, and when you wanted to change that, you went in and you edited the code, and you changed this, and you removed this, you know. So it was a little bit cumbersome. Uh, what this allows you to do is more of the Linux philosophy, right? So it's a little more modular. So we have here our bean, and I'm just going to comment that out. And then we're going to create another bean here. And in this case, what I want to do is fix something. Because right now what we've got is some bags of ground coffee and some bags of whole bean coffee. And that's not really optimal, right? So I'm going to take uh, this, I'm going to create a function which takes actually a flux of retail coffees and produces a flux of retail coffees, and we'll call this fix it. Return flux, flux.map, we'll take our old coffee, and let's see, hold on, scoot that down. All right, so we take our old coffee, uh, and we will map that. So we'll, let's see, so we've got uh, retail coffee, new, uh, yeah, new coffee, Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, equals new retail coffee. We'll take our old coffee ID. We'll take our old coffee's name. Name, get name. And then we will take the state and make it all whole bean. That is how you fix something, right? Mm -hmm. It's all good. Uh, now we just take our uh, new coffee dot sout and return new coffee. Sweet. All right. Now we have fix it. How do we integrate that into the pipeline? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We will replace our process it with process it pipe fix it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty nice, right? 
And, and this is a little bit of a holdover because we've got Spring Cloud function, which is a dependency. So we need to find our function definition, which is literally process, and I see I have a typo there, fix it. Fix. Okay, so that's it. Now, I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so now I'm going to restart this, and we'll go back to our source, and we'll restart our source, and we'll see what happens. Oh. Well, it's not going to happen at all if I don't uh, do that. Oh, it looks so much happier. All right, so let's try that again. Oh. Switching back and forth between Kotlin and Java, it's so easy. The only thing I really forget are semicolons. Go figure. All right, so everything's working. Everything's coming up holding. Life is good. Everything's going to our sink, our consumer. Everything's good. That's holding. So let me kill our source. Now, we still have like, what, 19 minutes? About 15. 15. Q&A, yeah. Oh, OK. All right, I will do a couple things here very quickly. And then we'll do Q&A. And then there's actually more, but we'll, I'll, I'll punch in the repos for that. OK, so, so far we've been using Rabbit, right? So how hard, uh, manager excluded, how hard is it to switch between Kafka and Rabbit? Anyone want to guess? There you go. It's really that simple. Because we had the foresight to include both binders and drivers, right? So they're both at our disposal. They're both ready to be consumed. So now I'm going to go over here, same thing. I'm just going to make this Kafka. And I'm going to point this to, to Kafka. And we'll restart that. And then I'll go to my sync. And I'm going to make this to Kafka. And we'll restart that. And we'll go back to our source and we'll just kick that off. And then when you can see, you can see as we do this, and we start this up, we're no longer hitting the AMQP stuff and the Rabbit stuff. We're accessing Kafka. So everything looks happy. We've got our producer config values, our consumer config values. This is our Kafka client. And there we go. So I go over here. Everything's passing through Kafka into our processor. Everything's passing through Kafka into our sync. Super simple, right? Now, this is what I think is kind of fun. So I'm going to go back here to my processor. Actually, I'm going to go back to my source first because it's just a good habit to get into. I'm going to kill my source. Good thing I'm not a journalist. OK, and I'm going to kill the processor. Now I'm going to go out to our directory. So desktop, Java SIG, CD source. Oh, come on. CD source. Typos. All right, and I'm going to open another and processor. All right, so I'm just going to do a Maven clean package on both these. Maven clean package. All right. So I'm just building these out of the command line just because that lets me show off something that I think is super useful. Um, as with all Spring Boot based applications, there's a certain pecking order in terms of environment. So I showed you an application.properties file. You can also replace that with an application.yaml file should you like to use YAML and, and have. I, I typically use YAML when I have you know, a reasonable amount of configuration properties and a lot of repeating values and a lot of nested values. And that seems to work pretty well, right? But otherwise, I stick with the properties file. Uh, but I went ahead and built these, right? And I'm going to externalize this. Now, we can create an application.properties with that YAML file in our target directory, and that's fine. That's an option. Or you can just pass things in on the command line, which is pretty cool. So java-jar, um, target, oops, target, I get excited and I, I hit the enter key. And then dash dash, and I'm going to go back here to my processor, perfect. And I'm going to, let's see, we have our sync still running, right? And our sync is listening to a Kafka pipeline. So we're going to leave that alone. And I'm going to say my binder coming in is Rabbit. Double quotes. Double quotes. Oh, yes. Because yeah. I use Z shell, as everybody does on, it, on Mac now, uh, unless they specifically override it. Everybody's on Z shell. I love Z shell. I really do. I use Oh My Z shell, but it gives it this beautiful coloring and all that. It's great. But uh, you do have to uh, enclose in quotes things that it can misinterpret. So I'm going to do that. Thanks for the cat. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, so I've started my processor. And as you can see, I have a Rabbit connection factory. So I've, I've got Rabbit. I also have Kafka because my input channel is listening to Rabbit and it's going to push stuff out on Kafka, right? That's what we need because our sync's listening on Kafka. 
So now I'm going to go to my source, Java dash jar, target, source, dash dash, and I'm going to do cheat and go back to my source, because typing is a thing. And I'm going to grab my binder. And again, my processor now is listening on what? On Rabbit. So I want to push things to Rabbit from my source, push my values. So I've just passed in a command line parameter, right? But if I go over here, I can see that I'm getting those. And everything's being transformed, right? Both transformation functions. It's pushing out whole beans, whole beans across the board. And I go back here to my sync, and there you go. So it's pulling in via Kafka pipelines, right? It's going from a Kafka source via Rabbit to a processor, which transforms it, pushes it out via Kafka, catches it in the sync. So nice. Okay. <coughs> All right, so I did that. What else do I, what else do I want to cover here? Uh, let's see here. Do I? Okay. Let's see. Actuator. Oh, gosh, yes. Function chaining I got. Rabbit Kafka I got. Scaling I can do. Um, so let's, let's do Actuator. We may just stop there. Or I'll quickly scale up a few just for fun. Uh, so we've got, uh, yeah, let's, let's do Actuator on, actually, let's just go out here. So we've got our processor. I'm going to scroll back here uh, because the processor actually shows you all of it. That's kind of nice. So I have a connection factory. I'm looking for Netty. Where that started. Oh, this is so much harder when you're doing the command line here. You see a port? Oh, there you go. It's right there. Sweet. Okay, so I'm going to grab that and localhost slash actuator. Oh, so nice. Okay, let me blow that up a little bit so we can actually read it. Okay, so these are all the actuator endpoints. And, and the reason you don't want to expose this just like across the board is because you can go in and really, really check out your application, like what all beans were created, right? So that's kind of. And, and if you notice here, uh, if you look, if you zoom in on the uh, thumb here, I'll see if that'll, yeah, look, that's a lot. So you see that a lot is being done for you about a config. And that's a lot of information about your application you probably don't want to share with the world, right? You also have things like, uh, where's env? Well, there's health. How did I skip env? Um, let's see, config props, that's interesting. So that tells you what came in. Um, let me back that off just a little bit, it's a little bit. Uh, so it tells you what all config properties you have. And if, by the way, if you're using Spring Cloud Config Server, it'll show those here as well. So it gives you everything that you're pulling into your application in terms of configuration settings. Uh, so let's see, let's go here. Let me do end. Here's end right there. This is a killer. Uh, let me back this out a little bit. So this will tell you what your Java, your JVM vendor is, what your build is. Um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to get down here, see your path values, uh, and which is super useful, right? But not for the bad people. <laughs> you don't want them to have this. Your Java home, your Kotlin home, so on and so forth. So it gives much more information than you necessarily want to share. I just showed you with the exposing all of them because, again, it makes my life a little easier here in the demo. But the thing that's particularly relevant is you can drill in on a particular binding, or you can just look at all bindings. And in this case, we see our process and fix it in channel, and it tells you, it shows you all the current configuration settings. This is kind of your hint on the things that you can change and configure to your heart's content. Uh, and then, of course, if you go down here, here's your output binding, uh, and it will tell you those as well. So it's a really like nickel tour, but it gives you a, just kind of an idea of actuator's power and the automatic integration you get just by adding that as a dependency, which is. Okay, so scaling. Uh, I told you I would show you scaling. It's super interesting. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to, actually I'm going to kill my processor here because then I can scale it more easily. And then I'll start that up here. This is my source, this is my processor, I'll reset that. And then we'll pick up where we left off. Actually, no, I'm not because I'm starting on Kafka. Hold on, grab it. Now we'll start. Gotta make sure I'm listening to the right place. Boom, it's now catching up, it's now running, and that's great. So let's go ahead and make this where we can do parallel processing, right? Edit, 
And this is something that IntelliJ has changed. Used to, it would allow this by default, and in most cases, you just wanted to restart. And they finally switched this, so that's kind of nice. So we can allow parallel run, OK. And then I just start another one, right? And whether it's Rabbit or Kafka, it automatically rebalances. And you can disable it. Uh, you can you know, partition and stuff to your heart's content. But by default, it just automatically starts splitting them. So scaling is that simple because we've defined a consumer group, so now they share in the load, which means we effectively double our capability. Same thing with sync here. I'll go ahead and go to sync, edit configuration. Oh dear. Scam likely. That's always nice to get those because I have no qualms whatsoever with shutting those down. Okay, so now we've got that. We'll go ahead and scale this out. Now the cool thing is, because I'm using Kafka in this play, in this particular instance, so that's nice because it makes this easy. It says Partitions assigned, sync three and two. Before, our instance, our only instance was handling all four partitions. Now it's handling sync zero and one. The second one's handling sync three and two, right? And that's great. So now let's fire up another one. Boom. Sync zero and one, which means this one is now handling sync three, sync two, so on and so forth. So. Scaling is really just as simple as adding another consumer or processor or whatever uh, function to the same consumer group. It's just really that simple. It, it, uh, let's see, there we go. And partitions assigned. One, zero, three, two. Yeah. So, um, so much more I can show you, but. Um, Rodrigo wants to go home at some point tonight. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me wrap up, because sometimes I do forget to do this. And we will do a Q&A, and then we'll go home, right? Or go somewhere else, and then home. All right. All right. So if you want to know more, uh, the, the, everything you saw here today, and then some is out under the Game of Streams repo on my GitHub account. Uh, that is the Java code, right? If you're a Kotlin fan, I have a similar uh, repo called Game of Streams Kotlin. Clever, right? Naming is one of the hardest problems in computer science. Uh, it is what it is. I'm not terribly clever. But, uh, and then if you want to know more about Spring Cloud Stream, I personally feel our documentation is super solid, right? So it's at Spring Cloud Stream under cloud.spring.io. And uh, go check it out. I'm uh, pretty proud of that documentation. I haven't contributed a ton to it, but I have contributed some. So uh, that's cool. Uh, if you want to reach me, by all means, please do. I check email from time to time. These are the two email addresses I check the least infrequently. Um, <laughs> that's mark at the hecklers.com and mhecklervnr.com. But the best way to reach me, the level best, is on Twitter, mkheck. Uh, if you, again, if you want to publish things, a question, comment, feedback publicly, that's cool. If you want to DM me, my DMs are open. So if you want to just ask something privately or comment on something privately, by all means, do so as well. Uh, don't let that hold you back. Uh, and with that, I guess we'll open it up to questions and see where it goes. Thanks. We have Mike here. So oh, yes. If anyone has a question. You know, a big question that sometimes we do is that uh, uh, we have to guarantee the message never to be lost, even in the situation. Probably it's never going to happen, but we still have to convince the business that uh, uh, for example, if they have transactions, uh, transactions they have, should now get lost. In this, um, how do we handle that on the stream? They're just by default. Um, oh, the, sorry. Well, I guess the question was of Mike. So <laughs> I was getting ready to repeat it, but I guess the question is loud enough. That's cool. Um, the, the, by default, whether it's the imperative or reactive approach, we have a retry max, what is it, retry template or a retry max? Uh, anyway, I can't remember what the name of the, the actual property is, but in each case, Spring Retry loop, you know, leaps in and handles a certain number of retries. By default, it retries after a second, and then it doubles that each time. Uh, the maximum is 10 seconds. The maximum retries is three by default, so you can do the math pretty quickly. That's six seconds, and it stops, so it'll try three times. Now, you can override that. You can tweak that. You can actually configure the underlying messaging platform, so you can set up dead letter queues in Rabbit or, or Kafka, you can configure things to where you automatically handle things, route them to retry. Um, so you have that full capability, but out of the box, it assumes that you'll get three chances uh, for retries. And that's all baked in with Spring Retry, basically. But what happened if the public hasn't crashed in the um, 
I guess it's always possible. Uh, at that point, you typically, and I kind of blithely skipped over this earlier, actually, now that I think about it. Um, with, with messaging platforms, they're typically handled by the critical infrastructure team. Uh, so you typically, if you're, and I'm, I'll get to your question, I'm, I'm doing the setup here. Uh, your messaging platform, whether it's Rabbit and Q, Kafka, whatever, is typically viewed as critical infrastructure. So if it goes down, you have a lot bigger problems than your messaging platform went down. Typically, everything went down. So what happens if an application processing those goes down? Uh, with Kafka, it's very simple to just pick up where you left off at your last known point. Uh, with Rabbit, if you set up a durable queue, same basic thing. Uh, so you have options for that. They typically involve some degree of cooperation or configuration, I should say, of your messaging platform underneath. Uh, I don't talk about that a lot because what, typically you'll set that up once. You'll do a lot of the other stuff over and over and over again once you've got that configured, once you kind of, I hate to use the old Ronco thing, the set it and forget it, but once you do that, you, can, you don't typically revisit that unless parameters change. So, hope that helped. Thank you. Sure. Um, a, a question, how sure. is serialization getting handled with all of this messaging going on in the demo? Uh, in the demo, it's fairly simple. If you have, um, if you, if you have um, multiple different, uh, let's say, processors and it's, it's pushing things out to Kafka, uh, and you have multiple different uh, pipelines that you're, you're, and partitions that you're handling, uh, there's no way to guarantee that sequencing. However, there are ways to guarantee that in your platform, whether it's Kafka or Rabbit MQ, if you enable that. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I mean like data to buy to wire serialization, not the sequencing. Like data, does it go in JSON, in bytes, oh, okay. in gRPC, like what is the uh, actual... Yeah, it assumes that you're going to be marshalling and marshalling the JSON, but it, it's not, uh, it's configurable. So whatever you want to push it as, if. Uh, Ultimately, it comes down to a, a basically a byte stream that you're you're going to enter. But yeah, if you want to use gRPC, if you want to use a custom uh, yeah, mechanism, it's, what's that? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, do you have anything built in that's handling tracing? So so. Um, oh gosh, good question. Yes. Um. Uh. We. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's I'm so uh, useful in. in you're trying to figure out what's happened and what, where. Yes, yes, it is. is. Uh, and, and in a live microservices architecture, you pretty much need that to, to you know, it's the, the old murder mystery, right? Uh, you need to know who did what with, you know, with what uh, tool and what room, uh, going back to the game of Clue. By the way, if anybody's not played Clue, that's another thing you need to do this weekend. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, we actually hired someone away from Netflix, uh, Adrian F. Cole, uh, to work on Sleuth and Zipkin. Uh, Netflix had pioneered, you know, led the development of Zipkin. I think they did all the initial development. And then they open sourced it as Open Zipkin. So then for a while you had this kind of fork, right? Uh, we pulled Adrian in to our orbit three or four years ago. And Adrian merged the two and kind of took over. Netflix really wasn't wanting to keep up with it. Uh, Adrian and a, a band of very volunteers and somebody else, I think, or a couple of somebody's putting in about halftime, uh, whipped it all into shape. So we have Zipkin and Sleuth, which is uh, a way of tracing throughout both HTTP-based uh, interactions among microservices and any other mechanism, basically. So it also includes Spring Cloud Stream, um, which is pretty powerful, right? So it, it, um, it has lightweight instrumentation that it adds, like your, um, I'm trying to think, it's been a while since I worked with this. I used to demo this all the time, and I haven't for a while, but you have a, a trace, which is end-to-end, -end, and you have a span, which hops between the different ones. And it keeps track of those, uh, again, via sequencing. So you know that this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and you assemble them all into a trace, and you can end to end see that if something was normally taking half a second, and now it's taking three seconds, you can, you can figure out which, which span is your problem span. Uh, so yeah, I, I strongly recommend uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth, which is based on Zipkin, and has a lot of different um, integrations uh, as well. I should mention too, uh, Actuator was completely retooled about a year ago to be based on Micrometer. Micrometer is kind of the SLF for J for metrics. Uh, so it's, yeah, I know it's, there's always some catchy, you know, it's the Uber or whatever, but, but it actually gives you a way to, again, integrate all those different metrics in various ways as well. So um, Micrometer has ties in with and, uh, and displays uh, output of zipping quite nicely.
but it's certainly not required. You can feed it into pretty much anything. Have we room for two more questions from the here? Hey, Mark. Thank you for the presentation. Hey, so, thanks for coming. Um, on the transaction management, uh, as you said, this is all offhand in which you know there's automatic transaction, especially in the uh, case of processor, which is basically talking to the incoming topic and talking about Kafka context, and then writing into the sync topic. Is there a way we can manually manage the offsets, I and mean, so that we don't really rely and you know especially take care of the transactions on our own? So does Spring Cloud API, Spring Cloud C API provide us manual management? Yes, you can get to any setting underneath that you need to based on a platform. I typically try to stay above that for anything, anything that I show because I think a lot of the power is that you can stay at that higher level of abstraction. But yes, it's, there's nothing precluding you from tweaking whatever you need. If you're specific to Kafka, you can access the Kafka properties, uh, either through application.properties or you can create a bean which actually configures exactly how you want it to interoperate or interact with Kafka underneath in this case. Yep. Oh, Mark, should we check if Ronnie has any questions? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and we'll come back to you, sir. Has, uh, Ronnie, do you have any questions? Uh, you might have to unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? This gentleman is nodding no. Is there anyone there with a question? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's trying to speak. Okay. Uh, okay, while they figure out how to unmute. Okay, we'll come back to this question, yes. Raleigh, we'll come back to you if, once you get through, I'm sure. Thanks for the presentation. Thank I you, have just a tiny question. I noticed that you run your application with just java-jar. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I suppose it's built with a manifest pointing to all the jars in the past path of the uh, Oh, that's an excellent question, and I feel terrible for having skipped over that now. <laughs> uh, one of the... Spring Boot has, I think, the, the top three features of Spring Boot, and, and Spring Cloud Stream is built on Spring Boot, as pretty much everything in the various Spring portfolio projects are, is, uh, I should say, everything is. Uh, but Spring Boot has three kind of big key features in my mind. One is simplified dependency management. So instead of having page after page after page of, of dependencies in a POM or a Gradle build file, you have uh, starter POMs. So you have, if you say, look, I want to provide a web API, like I did a reactive web API, that's a starter bomb that then will say, in order to provide that capability, I need to provide, I need to have these dependencies. So it keeps your, your dependency management really clean. It also gives you the advantage of version synchronizing. So if you have a version of Jackson in there, and a version of, I'm trying to think of something else, uh, let's say Lombok, because it's all that comes to mind, but obviously it's not within web. Uh, but it's these versions are version synchronized, so they're battle tested together, which means that you almost never have a version synchronous, uh, synchronicity issue. Um, so that's kind of nice. That's the that's the uh, simplified dependency management. Uh, the auto configuration I hit um, because that allows you to kind of if you're falling within that 80 to 90 percent of use cases, Spring Boot says, oh, you it'll it'll examine your your class path, it'll examine your code and your annotations and your properties and says, look. You're wanting to do this, I will auto configure that for you. You can turn that off, you can override certain elements of it, but in most cases it all just works, which is awesome. The third thing is the simplified deployment. And with Spring Boot, Spring Boot was not the first platform that included the capability of creating a, a, um, a fat jar or an Uber jar. But arguably it does it the best. And the reason I say that is because instead of just shading everything, taking 10 or 30 or 500 libraries and, and expanding them and saying, oh, you're using this class and this is using this class and this is using this class, I'll just put that in one place and point everything to it, which can lead to a couple different issues. One, it can lead to version issues. Uh, and two, it can lead to legal issues because if you have 15 different libraries and this one has an Apache 2 license and this has an MIT license and this has an Apache 3 license, you may have some problems, right? What Spring Boot did is it nested jars, and it gave you the ability to include that jar unmodified, which means you completely sidestep any legal issues that could possibly come up from quote, mixing licenses. It, it eliminates the version issues if you have the same class included in multiple dependencies and multiple different, as, as sub-dependencies, I guess. 
Uh, and it just pulls that jar in and nests that, along with every other jar, in one fat jar, in one executable jar. Now, that's somewhat large, right, compared to a plain old Java jar. Uh, but it's doing that. You don't have to point to your dash CP and your class path. You don't have to point to a manifest. It's all in there. So you literally just do a Java dash jar. Now, I didn't show you one thing, which when I do Spring Boot stuff, and in my book, I actually do cover, if you want a truly self-executing jar, you add a particular goal within your Maven build file, and it'll create it where you can just do like processor.jar. You don't even have to do the java-jar, which is really cool because then you can actually put it into your like system startup in Linux or whatever. So it's completely all there. It has a startup script listed in, within, built into the jar itself. So it's, it's super powerful. If you, now, if you do need to expand it, and there are some certain reasons for doing so, like if you're running in containers and you're creating an image, you can expand it, and it's super easy to expand because, again, it's nested. You're not trying to rebuild the, you know, the matchstick model that you use to shade a jar. You just have nested jars. You just expand it, and boom, 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 boom. All those jars are there whole in their entirety. So it's super, I mean, the, the flexibility and the power of it, I find, still find incredible. If you want to know more about that, by the way, uh, and I don't know if you do or not, but, but in the Spring Boot documentation, I think it's Appendix A, it explains the whole concept of the nested jars and what it came to. Super fun reading if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so check it out. So that's, a, that's a great question. I'm sorry I kind of skipped over that because it's a, it's a great capability. Spring Boot just kind of gives us for, for free as an added benefit. So. Thank you, Mark. Uh, last question here. I believe we have some technical difficulties with uh, oh, Rome. Okay. So last Hello. question from within. Hi, uh, you earlier mentioned that um, you touched upon the fact that Reactor is used as a sink and not in between. So usually you would use something like Kafka for the emission processing and then use React as a sink. Uh, can you elaborate more on why it doesn't operate as well as in between, well, as a processor? And you can use uh, publishers, Reactor Studio publishers, in all three or any number of, of you know, microservices, and I, and I did put them in there, but where you're limited, at least at this point, I, and I like to point to Kafka because I think it's very, it's more clear when you do it. What is Kafka? It's a file, right? You just write into it and you read out of it by saying, go to this point and start, and then read everything after that, right? So, so the idea of a reactive publisher is it's push-based, and you can't have that if you're reading from a file. So, so that's where the limitation currently lies, and that limitation can't be fully eliminated until you have some kind of a Kafka driver or that, that maybe will buffer a certain amount of that and keep it hot, uh, as a hot publisher, for instance, uh, or, or even a cold publisher, just waiting to be subscribed to, uh, or you have some change in the underlying architecture of Kafka. Wouldn't hold my breath on that, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the distributed log is the USB, so I yes. don't expect that. Yes, and, and I mean, you have the same issue with Rabbit, just not that clear cut, because you have a kind of a live routing mechanism with Rabbit, but you still, uh, you still typically, in order to consume values from a Rabbit queue, for instance, you're still gonna go out and go, what do you have, what do you have, you know? Uh, and especially if, with Kafka, it's just much more clear cut with Kafka, because you can go, well, yeah, obviously a file's not gonna tell me, hey, take that one, take that one, take that one. Uh, so, so again, when you start looking at how do I put this? When you start looking at trying to fake out or to simulate a, a push-based mechanism from a, a flat file, for instance, you know, like, I shouldn't say flat file, a, a, a file, let's we'll call it that. Uh, when you start trying to simulate that, what you have to do is some, some gymnastics, and you have to recognize that if you're buffering a certain amount, how much is enough, how much is too much, because you can run out of memory. Um, so that's, I think, what's holding things up at that point. So, so you, can, you can wrap that in publishers. You can, you can have a publisher that pushes uh, values in as a flux, for instance. You can have one that comes out and pushes it, or pulls it, excuse me. But the, the, the in-between is that point that you can't, you can't make push-based. Uh, so, so where you gain, where your most potential gains are on the front end. So if you're like pushing things to a web API, for instance, a reactive web API, or on the back end where you're pulling them from a web API. But in between, and, and basically any time you're dealing with the, uh, the messaging platform, you're still on a polling-based consumer. 
So that's that's kind of where I went with that. It's 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 cool to think about, but it, we're basically depending on RabbitMQ engineers and Kafka engineers to go, yeah, we see the value of this, we see how we can make this work without worrying about we're going to crash and have issues and so on and so forth. So, so that's what we're saying. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, then I think we are at the end of questions. Thank you so much for speaking and for the great interaction questions. Uh, we'll be back for the Thank you very much for joining for the next meeting. March 19th. March 19th. Ken Cozen. Ken Cozen will be here, so please do show up. It's going to be amazing as well. Yeah, Ken's awesome. You don't want to miss that.